Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Deep Tech Studio. We have with us C.S. Murli, who is the chairman of the entrepreneurship cell, SID ISC. Welcome, Mr. Murli. Nice to have you on board. Thank you. We will have a conversation about the future of deep tech ecosystem in India. And while we will be at it, if you could explain or break down the SID's work in the area of deep science incubation and what do they offer? Okay. Uh, before I start specifically about SID's, uh, what SID does in deep tech, I just want to take maybe a minute to define uh, you know, what we want to do. Deep tech for various reasons is being used too loosely today, these days. Okay. Almost every company, every startup claims that it's deep tech. Now it is true that since uh, technology has become very ubiquitous, you do find technology in pretty much any domain, any kind of startup, you need to use technology. However, what I want to differentiate is between startups that leverage technology and startups that build technology. Now, clearly somebody has to build technology for somebody else to be able to use it. And by the way, using technology is not a trivial task. I mean, you still need to be very clever to how you put it together. I mean, we have enough examples now, whether you take Swiggy or Uber or anything, they deploy various technologies very well, okay, but they don't themselves build technology. So I just wanted to highlight the difference between uh, the reason being that because we are located in IASC, okay, our focus is on what therefore we call deep science startups, which actually are engaged in building new technologies. Sometimes the technology directly has a use and sometimes it becomes a platform for others to deploy in a suitable way. Okay. And the reason I wanted to highlight this difference is because building technology takes far more time than deploying technology. And this key difference is very crucial for some of the questions that you asked me in the beginning about what does it take to build deep science uh, startups. So with that background, let me just jump into uh, what SID is and what we do. Uh, SID has been around for a very long time, but our focus on startups is relatively new, about 10 years old. And our objective is very simply to help, tra to help translate science via startups to build products and solutions that are very relevant to the market today. Okay. And which is why, you know, underlying almost all of our startups is some emerging, you know, some new technology, which is being built, you know, from the ground up. Okay. Uh, this is one. Second is uh, while, uh, you know, IASC is also, as most of you may know, a research led institution. In fact, more than 80% of the students are actually pursuing PhD or MS by research, and only a smaller percentage are into undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. Okay. This is one uh, fact which is probably not as well known to a large number of people. And the second is IASC is also very strong in pure sciences like physics, chemistry, biology, et cetera, as well as engineering disciplines. So to that extent, our objective at SID is to incubate startups which truly are building uh, new technologies okay, in any domain, because IASC has the capability to support startups in any of these domains. The second key factor is, uh, while we obviously incubate them on our campus, okay, the incubation itself is open to all entrepreneurs. They don't necessarily have to be students, alumni, or faculty. So long as idea is truly based on science, we will evaluate it and consider it for incubation. And just to give a snapshot of where we are, as I said, the process really accelerated about 10 to 12 years ago. And to date, we have incubated roughly 65 companies, startups. Several of them have already graduated and moved out. And uh, at the moment, we have about 25 startups on campus. And typically, they stay with us for about two to four years. And our objective is to incubate roughly about uh, 15 to 20 startups, new startups every year. Understood. So Mr. Murli, also tell us, how do you help startups on various fronts? And that can include mentorship, raising funding, or exploring newer markets. Um, where does SID's work come to picture? Okay. Uh, to answer that, let me first talk about how we actually evaluate startup proposals. As I said, any entrepreneur can submit a proposal to us. So the first thing we do, obviously, is to see whether there is truly some science behind it. Okay, Because as I said, 
we want to make sure that while as an incubator we provide physical space and uh, several other benefits that we really want to tap into the intellectual capital in IAS. So that is our first screening. And following that, we take them through the usual steps as this, like any other investor would. You know, how good is the entrepreneurial team? How good is idea? Is there truly a market opportunity, et cetera? And, uh, and this is a fairly uh, intensive process. Uh, and sometimes it could you know, last for a calendar time of almost six months from the time the entrepreneur talks to us first. And the reason for that very simply is because these can be across very, very different domains we need to find the right experts to be able to validate the idea. And the way we do it is after the initial screening, which is done by me and my team, we take the help of an IAC faculty, depending on the domain, to help us take a look at whether it's truly a new thing or is it something that uh, you know, doesn't have merit. If all of those turn out to be successful, the final step is a more formal business presentation and a review where in the team or review team, we include even uh, not only IAC faculty and other technical experts, but we include one or two domain experts from the industry who bring in a business perspective. And quite often we also invite one or two investors, you know, who obviously put on the hat of uh, you know, market opportunity, scalability, et cetera. So when all of this is done successfully, okay, we say yes to incubation. And what that means is, we provide them some physical space okay? because since they are building new uh, technologies and most of these are actually companies which are building something physical as opposed to pure software companies. So depending on the domain they are in, quite often they need access to not only faculty at IASC who are technical mentors, but also equipment that resides in these labs, okay? which are obviously something that uh, each startup cannot afford to buy on its own. Okay? Like, for example, there's a center for nanoscience, which has equipment for product characterization and so on. Okay. Uh, plus, of course, through our own uh, team, as well as through our network of mentors, we also provide them business mentoring. And uh, of course, at the right time, we also hook them up with the both angel investors as well as VCs when you know they're ready for fundraising. You know, actually, I used to be a venture capitalist many years ago. So I have a, I continue to maintain a good contact with both angels as well as uh, VCs. And, but again, as I said, uh, typically VCs get interested and even angels get interested only when the company has made progress to be able to demonstrate that they have a prototype or something like that. In fact, this is one of the challenges of uh, true deep science companies that they need to survive until the stage when they become of interest to investors. In fact, this has been in our experience in the last 10 years, one of the biggest challenges that uh, startups face of this nature. Mr. Ryan, thank you for the insight. It's quite detailed and we understood the various stages that a startup is incubated at um, SID. Now, what are some of the milestones that you would say, uh, notable milestones that you have recorded of the startups that you mentor or incubate? Um, in fact, there was one uh, which is uh, you know, of a different category. I, I don't know if you're aware, but a company called Strand Life Sciences, which was started by four IASC faculty 20 years ago, it got acquired by Reliance a uh, few months ago. Okay, so that clearly a very successful exit for them as well as for us. And, uh, but at that time, we didn't really have a formal incubation process. I mean, the IAC faculty decided on their own to thought, but IAC did support them to the extent that we could. However, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we have really uh, developed a model, incubation model, where, as I said, you know, the process of selection, incubation, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and as I said, because these companies are actually building physical products, the time that they take to come up with even the first version of a product, okay, is ranges anywhere from three to five years. Okay, so to that extent, you will find that most of the 65 companies that I mentioned and the 25 on campus, only a few are actually already in the market. There are several others are still in the development stage. But let me pick two or three examples of those which are already in the market. Okay, there is a company called Patshod, which was again started by one of the uh, some IAC faculty along with uh, you know, other co-founders. 
And this is again based on research done by one of the faculty members over several years. And this is in the area of um, uh, management of chronic diseases. For example, as we know, uh, India unfortunately is referred to as the diabetes capital of the world. And uh, while diabetes is a well-known disease, okay, there is no cure for it, but it can be managed very well. Okay. And so what this company has is a handheld device which manages, uh, which measures HbA1c, which is the most accurate indicator for uh, diabetes. So, and this is again based on new technology and they've added many other uh, diagnostics to this. They are already in the market. They work closely with Tata Trust to start deploying it in various states. Okay, and also one of the things that uh, uh, you know that they had to go through was, as you probably know, India until recently did not have a well-defined uh, uh, mechanism for certification of medical devices. I think if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, I think the government came up with this Class A, Class B, and Class C devices only in the last. Uh, four years or so. And necessarily these companies have to go through that certification process, which takes time. Okay. So this is one company. Another company that I can uh, give as an example is a company called uh, General Aeronautics. They essentially build drones. Now you might ask, uh, you know, drones seem to be everywhere. I mean, right from movie shootings and people say you can buy it for a few hundred dollars in uh, retail stores, which is true. But then when you need to deploy drones for specific purposes, they need to be designed for that purpose. And obviously they need to be very efficient and meet the requirements. So what uh, General Aeronautics has focused on is on what they call precision agriculture. Now the problem, underlying problem here is that while pesticides and fertilizers are you know, in use, most in, in India, the most of the, these are sprayed manually. And especially if you look at pesticides, 90% of it gets wasted. It actually falls to the soil and not on the plant. And the second is also poses a danger to people who actually are involved in spraying. Okay. So this particular drone designed by uh, General Aeronautics uh, has, the, uh, you know, has been designed specifically to highly uh, optimize the spraying process. You know, for example, the droplet size, uh, where is it to be directed and you know, things like that. Okay. And they're already in the market. They work with some of the large uh, uh, companies in agriculture like ITC and others. And they have already, uh, you know, uh, as I said, deployed it in several states. So these are two examples of our startups, which, have, which are already in the market. And as I said, several of them are still in the, almost in the final stages of their product. And uh, you know, it takes time to build the product and it takes money too. <laughs> As you're mentioning about money, then let's uh, move on to the next topic, which is very relevant to the last point that you made. The funding in the deep tech space has a lot of barriers and vis-a-vis -vis compared to other domains. And there is a need for patient capital. The lab to market time is uh, more than what is anticipated necessary. The inception point comes later for a lot of technologies. With the current market situation, the funding slowing down, the meaning of valuations changing, what should VCs know about deep tech and um, how will that affect the funding? Yeah, I think very, very important question. Okay. Uh, let me step back a little bit and put in context why India should be doing deep science companies. Very simply, if you look at just healthcare as one segment, there are many other segments, but let me just stick to healthcare. Clearly, India needs a lot of healthcare solutions which are designed for India. For instance, very simply, uh, you know, if you live in a big city, you have access to diagnostic labs, you have access to the best hospitals, the finest doctors, but that is only a small percentage of the population. Now, what do you do with the people who live in even uh, tier two cities? Forget about uh, you know, villages. Okay. So in other words, and the existing solutions simply do not work there because they need highly clean you know, air conditioned environments with very highly trained technicians and so on. So a lot of products that are being built by these uh, deep uh, science startups actually cater to the need, which is, you know, makes, for example, if it is a medical device, makes it portable, makes it uh, workable in very harsh environmental conditions, requires very little technical training for it to operate and so on. But as I said, because it's a device, it needs time to build, it needs manufacturing, it needs initially prototyping, good design, and uh, so on. Okay. Unfortunately, most of the media 
coverage on startups that we see are uh, you know two extremes one is either fintech software fintech startups or you have the e-commerce companies now if it is a pure software company it doesn't require much capital whereas if it is an e-commerce company it requires a huge amount of capital whereas these fall somewhere in between they need a fairly substantial amount of capital and unlike fintech companies which can succeed within maybe a year or two years these require at least four years to come up with a product and maybe another five to ten years to really see whether they can scale the product so i think the important therefore to recognize is that we need startups to solve major problems that face the country today but the good thing is if they're successful they their product have applicability globally it's not as if they have to restrict themselves to the indian market so this is one second is because of this media coverage and for various other reasons okay the mindset prevailing in uh, you know uh, in many segments of the ecosystem is that you know that the startup needs to be funded when they reach revenue stage or if it is a software company 50 lakhs is a good enough capital for software 50 lakhs is good enough okay, whereas for e-commerce even 50 million is not good enough so the kind of startups we have require three to five crores in the first three to five years to build their thing. And very few investors are willing to step forward. Because, and, uh, see, they have their own challenges, I agree. For example, I think one of your questions would be, you know, what do VCs need to understand? Okay. Now, there are several VCs who understand. In fact, quite a few of the VCs who talk to our companies, they're very interested in the companies, but they would like to invest only when they have made progress and reach a, a stage where they start showing revenues. So sometimes the VCs have to answer to their LPs, and which is where the problem could be. So in other words, I think you know, we need to go back and even educate LPs on you know, what kind of fund they want to invest. But the good news is that I think there is increasing awareness that these kind of companies, which are more what we call a high risk, high reward profile. Okay. So there are a few investors stepping in. So hopefully we will see better and better uh, uh, yes. investments happening in the very early stage absolutely the deep tech ecosystem in india and uh, the insights we gained on how to make india the deep tech destination where are the challenges and why there is a need for deep deep science startups and sid's role in it uh, it was really enlightening thank you